So now it is a huge, huge honor for me to welcome to the stage Huey Lewis and Jimmy Kimmel. Hi, everyone. Huey Lewis, everyone. That's him. Thank you for coming. Huey, can you hear me? What? <laughs> I said, can you hear me? What? Okay, we're going to have a problem here tonight. Uh, no, Huey, you can hear me, right? Can, uh, we are I okay? I can kind of hear you, yeah. So uh, I'm sure you're tired of talking about it, but I think that's kind of the thing that we want to open with is how are you doing hearing-wise? Well, not good today. You know, I, it fluctuates, and um, but I, it's bad today. I, I, I go one to ten. I'm a, f I'm a two and a half today. Two and a half, that's on the low end. That's not good. Six is as good as I've been since my hearing collapsed two years and a month ago. Are you still able to achieve an erection? <laughs> able to what? I said, are you still able to achieve an erection? I'll use sign language. Oh, yes. yeah. Yes, okay. In fact, in fact, since this happened, I have an erection pretty much all the time. Oh, wow, well, yeah. that's a nice side effect. <laughs> have you recovered from the Niners losing the Super Bowl? Uh, not quite. I'm still working on that. I thought they were going to win by a big, uh, big margin. We got to see uh, Joe Montana there pretending to play the harmonica. And I remember very well when I grew up, the Niners were my favorite team because they sang on your album. I grew up in Las Vegas. We didn't have a team. And so I saw, oh, I like Joe Montana. And there he is on Hip to be Square. And so that is the, the <laughs> depth of the impact that you've had on me. I was even rooting for the teams that you rooted for, except for the Giants. I fucking hate them. But um, that video, I know that video was shot over the course of like two years or something, right? I feel like that's the closest I'm ever going to get to be being on the love boat in the 70s. It's quite a co collection of random people, <laughs> ranging from Brandon Flowers of the Killers to uh, June Lockhart, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> who you told me backstage has been to like 50 Huey Lewis in the news shows. Yeah, June Lockhart's a big fan. You know, the, the, the video, the idea for the video, I should tell people, was uh, I had this idea, because Jimmy and I are kind of pals. I, I probably, Kind of. I, I mean... <laughs> Well, I, I don't want to pretend. <laughs> he doesn't know. like to say it publicly, but yes. No, no. And so I had this idea for the song at, that, to have Jimmy lip sync it. Like, you know, Chevy Chase did the Paul Simon song, You, you Can Call Me Al. And I thought that would be a great idea for Jimmy just to lip sync the whole thing. And so I had, it was like an epiphany for me. And I called my son, who works at the Kibble Show, and I said, Austin, I got a great idea. He said, what? I said, how about I ask Jimmy to lip sync the whole song? And he goes, Dad, that's a pretty big ask. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, you're right. Of course it is. And then he suggested that we have everybody do a line or two. Well, you know I would have done it gladly if, if, <laughs> I'd, if your son hadn't killed my big chance. Where is Austin? <laughs> Before we go any further, and I don't want to make this about me, but I do want to thank somebody in the, in the audience who is Cleto, my band leader on the show. And Cleto and I have been very, very close friends since I was nine years old. He was 10 years old. He grew up across the street from me. And in 1984, Cleto broke into a boat and stole a, a, a carton of cassette tapes. And one of those cassette tapes was uh, Picture This, your album, your second album. And, and that was the best day that, the best day of my life. That, Me that. too. And we loved it, and we listened to it over and over and over again. And, uh, and now I'm in one of your videos, so that's and, pretty exciting. So and thanks, Sal, Cleto. And Sal my cousin, steals yes. the show in the video, right? Cousin Sal. Cousin Sal does here. Uh, here. Uh, a little Sal, wave to the folks. Where are a little Sal? tribute to the to the uh, Heart of Rock and Roll video by dipping his head in the ice water. So 
I want to start by talking about, by the way, it's funny that we're here in an event sponsored by American Express when that was the original title of your band, but you were forced to change it because you didn't want to get sued by American Express, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's how you became the news. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about your dad to start with. Your dad was a radiologist. True. And a jazz drummer. True. And piano player, too. And I piano think. player. And what kind of music did your dad get you into? What did you... He liked, he liked big band jazz, all, usually with, with no singers. He didn't like singers. I mean, you know, in those days, big bands had a singer, but the singer would only sing like three songs. And then most of it... And he, he always felt like the singer got in the way, but he, he loved big band jazz. Did he, feel like, did he feel like the singer got in the way of Huey Lewis and the News? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was, my, my dad was kind of a hard ass. He, he never, ever saw us perform until, like, for, you know, for years and years, until late, late in his life, we played uh, the Worcester Centrum, and he's from Boston originally. So I flew him back to, uh, to Boston for for these three shows, and to meet his to say say hello to his mother, my grandmother, who he hadn't seen in thirty five years, and you know, just strange Irish, dysfunctional family, and uh, uh, but at that point he he saw what we had become because we were playing the Worcester Centrum, we're doing three nights, and on the opening night Tina Turner showed up at the gig and came back and and and. Um, you know, had all these kind words to say and everything. My dad didn't know who she was, but but was super impressed that this big, black, beautiful woman cared about his kid. You know, yeah. And uh, but at that point on, he became a fan, and and he he was um, Tina he was, Turner did it for him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. His original, I must say, his original uh, advice to me, which was still his advice later on, was. Keep playing the harmonica, he said. I said, what? He says, I, every time I said I got a new record, he says, are you playing harp on it? I said, yeah, a little bit, Dad, a little bit. He says, oh, man, you got to play. You got to keep playing that harmonica because that's what, they can't take that away from you. You know, you play that harp, that, they can't take that away from you. I'm telling you, this Huey Lewis shit, it's here today, gone tomorrow. It's <laughs> exactly what he told me. Do you remember... Your first harmonica. Where'd I get my first harmonica? Yeah, where'd you get the first one? I got my first harmonica from a guy when my, my parents split up when I was 11. And uh, my mother rented a room to a boarder who was a folk singer, a guy called Billy Roberts, who wrote Hey Joe, by the way. Wow. Yeah, wrote Hey Joe and played harmonica with a little neck brace. And he had a ton of harmonicas, most of which were out of tune. And he gave me a bunch of those harmonicas. And that's how you started playing a harmonica. That's how I started. Hey. And, um, and my mother gave me a Bob Dylan record. My mom, you know, was a hippie and, and hung out with all the beat poets. And she gave me a Bob Dylan record and said, check this out. The, the poets love this guy. I've been around you when you talk about your mother. And it blows people's minds, uh, the environment in which you grew up in. Like, who would come to your house to visit your mom? Well, what? lots of people. Yeah. Lots of people. You know, he... In the early days, it was the, the beat poets, Allen Ginsberg and, you know, uh, 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 Philip Whalen, Gary Snyder, Lou Welch, uh, Charlie Mingus. Wow. We had, I had Dizzy Gillespie at my house one time. Had Ben Webster and, uh, and Jimmy Rushing with Ralph Sutton playing piano, my old man on drums. This is my living room in, 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 uh, in, in Marin County. And my old man's playing drums. Ralph Sutton's on Eddie Figueroa on bass. Ralph Sutton on piano, and Ben Webster and Jimmy Russian singing. I remember. I remember the song because I was a kid, and it was a, it was a nasty song. It was called "Hannah's Big Black Ass Is on the Block for Sale." <laughs> and Jimmy Russian, and they sang that too. That was our first dance at my first wedding. <laughs> Wow, that's pretty crazy. So, you uh, when did you form your first band? How old were you when you you formed your first band? I didn't. Band? I joined. Uh, I joined. Let me see. My first band would. My first real band was Slippery Elm in, in college. My, my 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 first freshman college, 
Your slippery elm, a slippery which was a throat lozenge that, ah. that for some reason we named our band after. I and no you would play gigs uh, around town in college? We played, mostly we played fraternity parties uh-huh. at Cornell. And at Cornell, you could, I was at Cornell, and you could work, we could play Friday night, Saturday morning. They'd have these things where, uh, you know, a, a fraternity would wake a sorority up. At six o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning, and have a kegger, and they on a on a, like a Saturday or a Sunday, and they'd hire a band for that. So we we could you could literally do a gig Friday night, Saturday, and then Saturday night, and then Sunday, and so we could we made some pretty good cash. That's like a Vegas schedule. Yeah. Right. In college, so you guys made money doing that, and from yeah. at that point, did you know that that's what you wanted to do forever? Yeah, I, I, I'd already known that. I knew that. I figured that out in Spain. Uh, it's kind of, I hope it's not too long a story. I'll try and tell it quickly. I, was between, I, I graduated from prep school in uh, 1960. Uh, I graduated from eighth grade in 1963, in June of 1963. In July of 63, I turned 13. I was a year young because I skipped second grade. And then in August, I went away to prep school for four years, and uh, neither one of my parents has ever been there. <laughs> and uh, so I was kind of raised as a, 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 by the prep school, and we had, it was all boys, coat and tie, think dead poet society, that's pretty close. And um, after four years, I was a preppy, you know, I mean, I was, uh, I'd, I'd been accepted to Cornell Engineering School, I was gonna go to school, and my old man said, there's only one more thing I'm gonna make you do, and that's, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I was 16. He said, as far as I'm concerned, you're, all the decisions are yours. You know, you're grown up, you, uh, whatever. But one more thing, what? Don't go to college yet. He said, take a year off and bum around Europe. I said, really? I wanted to go play ball and all that. But no, he was going to make me bum around Europe. So I was playing harmonica. I took the harmonicas, hitchhiked across the country, got my way over to Europe, which is another long story. <laughs> and, but finally got... And then hitchhiked all over Europe, and I would busk with harmonica. And then I went down to North Africa. Uh, I, I, I had a traveling partner, a guy called Michael Jeffries, South African guy. And we hitchhiked all the way down to North Africa, Casablanca and Marrakesh. And, you know, we got so stoned in Marrakesh, we couldn't leave. Is, is really, <laughs> that's the long and the short of it. I mean, every day we were going to leave, nah, you know, nah. Smoke another pipe of keef, you know. And, and so we, we were there for like two or three months. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> but I played harmonica in the square. There was a snake charmer over here and the, and the acrobatic bicyclist who would, over here and, and me with my little pig nose uh, amplifier in my hat. And so, you know, I'd make like three or four dirhams and the, and the youth hostel was one dirham and all you could eat was a half a dirham. I thought, hey, I'm making it. And then, then finally we got out of, I got out of North Africa, and I'm <laughs> hitchhiking. I finally get across from, from, to Spain. I take the, f the, the ferry from Spain, and I'm hitchhiking, and this guy picks us up. I'll never forget him. His name was Jimmy Van Der Aa. He was like 85 years old or so. Dutch guy with a real handlebar mustache, big, long handlebar mustache. And he's driving a 1925 Chevrolet, pulling an Airstream trailer. This is 1969, and I'm hitchhiking in South Ceuta, Spain, and here on the horizon, here comes this Chev Chevrolet. I go, I can't believe and unbelievably, he stops. So we got in, and he, he liked to drink a little bit, so he, we, we stopped at every bar, and, and we were going to try and get to Portugal. We are drive to Portugal on every bar on the way. And somewhere along the way, he we had you know, after bar five or six, he drove off, we were on a levee with water, and he drove off into the water. And, and now we're, the water's up here on the floorboards. And now he gets out of the car, takes a fire extinguisher, and sprays this distributor. Apparently, that dries things out. I didn't know that. So this had happened to him before. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe. But anyway, now we drive out, no, pr he just gets in the car and drives right out of the water, and bang! Now we get to the Portuguese border at 
about 11 o'clock at night, and there's a little ferry, but I don't have my passport. My passport has disappeared. What's happened is it's floated out of my knapsack, which was in back at the Airstream trailer, and I don't have a passport. So they go on. He and my buddy Michael Jeffries leave without me, and they leave me right there. I can't go to the border. I got to go back to Seville and get a passport. So I, 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 I spend the night there I, in that little town. I found some, I, I heard rock and roll music, found a, a corrugated kind of an office building where there's, these kids were playing. And I, I knocked on the door and they answered. I said, hey, so I, they let, I jam, I showed them, I, th I taught them a song or two, I can't even remember what it was. And then I slept right there. And the next day I hitchhiked back to Seville and I tried to get a, um, this is a long story, isn't no, it? No, but it's, it's interesting. Is this too long of a story? No. Uh, no. All right, so now I get, this is really how it went the bug, bug bit, honestly. And so now I get back to Seville, and I get to the embassy, which is out of town, and hard to hitchhike to because it's disjointed. But I get to the embassy. It's Friday, like 5 o'clock, and they literally shut the door in my face and, I, and say, you know, you, I, you have $20. I said, No. They said, well, come back on Monday with 20 bucks and we'll get your passport. I said, oh, my God, is that it? Yeah, see ya, see ya. Boom. So now I hitchhike back into town. I meet a night watchman in an old construction site. Meet. <laughs> I, say, I befriend an old watchman. I said, can I sleep, night watchman, can I sleep right here? He says, sure. He's got a little fire going. And we had this wonderful conversation that, you know, he didn't speak any English. I didn't speak any Spanish. But <laughs> somehow we understood one another. And we had a great evening. And he, he taught me how to say, uh, yo soy estudiante que es perdizo un pasaporte. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a student. I lost my passport. And could I trabajo? Is there any way I could do some work or whatever like that? And meanwhile, I was busking, playing harmonica with a hat. Well, now I'm busking in Seville trying to get the 20 bucks for Monday. And these kids come by. And these kids, oh, they love the harmonica. And they ask me questions. They speak a little English. They find out I'm from San Francisco, which is all over Time Magazine now because the, the, the Summer of Love is the biggest news everywhere. And I know all about it because of my mom and all this stuff. And oh my gosh, they think it's great. And then I tell them I lost my passport. I got to make some money. They say, no problem. We'll throw a concert for you. And so we auditioned for guitar players. And we found this Australian guy called Michael who'd had an, uh, who, who lived in the, in the outback in Australia but he had one record, which was a Sonny Terry Brownie McGee record, which had, you got me running, you got me hiding, all kinds of real nice blues stuff. So he and I, we hire this guy, hire, we say, yeah, let's, you want to do this? Yeah. And we, we would shed it, me and him, for like three or four days to work up some songs. And these kids put up these posters about Huey, Los Blues, and all this stuff everywhere. But, and through this, Big concert at, at, their, at their school, right? Huge concert. And now comes the night of the concert, and the place is sold out. And I mean, there must have been 1,200 people. It was big. And, 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 and th there's a stage like this, and then there's another pod in the middle, just a little round stage where Michael and I are going to perform out in kind of in the middle of the audience. But meanwhile, the opening act is a band called Los Nuevos Tiempos. The New Times, and they are frickin' tremendous. They are really good, and they're pros, and they got a horn section, and they're just unbelievable, and they're all, you know, wardrobed and choreographed, and they were tremendous. I thought, oh, my God, we're following this, right? So they finish, and we come out, we get announced, and we get polite applause, and then pin drop silence. I mean, dead silence. And I'm out there on the podium, kind of amongst the audience, and Michael's here, and we start playing. I think we did a Lightning Hopkins tune or something, you know. And I'm playing harmonica, and you can hear a pin drop. And in the middle of the song, I'm thinking, we are dying here. We are dying. But somehow I finished the song, whoop, and the place erupted in a standing ovation. And that's when I thought, I like this. <laughs> I want to do this.
<laughs> of course. How much money did they give you? Uh, well, that's the other thing. The, the, the students were communists. They were socialists. Oh, shit. So, so, not, so what they decided is we were celebrating. We had like $160 or something. Yeah. And I went, this is nice. I got 160 bucks here or something, you know? And then they said, let's go celebrate. Let's go to dinner. We all go to dinner, and there's a bunch of people, 20 people. And <laughs> they order everything in sight. And they give me my 20 bucks, and they pay for dinner, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> you can't trust communists, you yeah, know? Yeah, you see? And they're the worst with money. Uh, and actually, there's a little, uh, another little kind of a funny side story to it, because I, we were so well-received on that night, and I got a bunch of cards in my pocket from people, club owners, who said, hey, man, come play our club. Come play our club. And so we thought, what the hell? We might as well stick around and... You know, we'll play some gigs and make some money. Now we're professional musicians now, so so we took a gig the following Friday. I think our concert was like on a Saturday. Took a thing for the following Friday, and so we go to the club to do our our gig. And now it's a noisy club. It's not it's not like a, 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 an art center where everybody's wrapped attention. It's a noisy club. And once again, the opening act is another. Uh, band who are tremendous and you know a big nine piece band tremendous now we go on and by this point I remember Michael had broken one of his strings he had a steel string guitar and he broke one of the strings and we couldn't find a steel string in, in Spain it's all nylon strings so he had one nylon string and three and three uh, 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 I mean f five steel strings and it kept going out of tune and I had my harmonicas were getting kind of soiled and not, not kind of out of tune a little bit. And so we played this, and people were talking. And Anyway, we bombed. We bombed so bad it was embarrassing. And uh, But the bug had still bit, you know. Yeah, yeah. And Michael and you broke up then? You didn't stick I, with him? I don't know where Michael went. I yeah. don't know what happened to Michael. And what about your asshole friends who left you uh, with no passport? <laughs> <laughs> I hope you broke they, it off. I got with the them. twenty bucks and I got the passport. <laughs> yeah. um, you um, you have played with a lot of people. Um, you toured with a lot of people, and I know that one of the things that we, they like us to talk about uh, is your musical influences. And uh, have you ever toured or performed with someone that you idolize? Somebody who was really a huge influence on you musically. Wow. Uh, well, you know, I, I toured with Joe Cocker, and I, li I like Joe yeah. Cocker a lot. Yeah. Uh, uh, and yeah, yeah. Yeah, Joe. And he, and by the way, Joe Cocker was the most wonderful, generous, careful Englishman. It was nothing like this this out of control crazy man that he was painted out to be. And when he's doing all this stuff, he was playing drums because he was a drummer. Joe was a drummer, and that's what he's doing in his mind. He's playing drums while he's singing, uh, but he was a lovely guy. And we is we that right? Is that why he was physically he he's, behaved he's like that? He's playing drums. Wow! He started his career. He's a drummer, and then he sang on the drums. And when he and when he stands up, that's what he's doing. He's, he's playing drums. Oh wow, boy, yeah. that's interesting. And then I guess John Belushi was playing drums too, imitating <laughs> him. I wonder if Belushi knew he was playing drums. Yeah, I don't know if Belushi knew he was playing drums or not. Do you remember the first time you heard one of your songs on the radio? I do. I remember it like it was yesterday. I, in fact, um, well, when "Do You Believe in Love" was released, um, we had it. We had uh, noticed that KFRC, which is the big top forty station in San Francisco, was going to add it. it was going to add it this week, and they play the added records on Tuesdays between two and six o'clock. So we gathered the whole band at my house in Larkspur, and we, you know, watched the radio. <laughs> we had the radio on, and uh, and they played it on right away, pretty much like about forty-five minutes into the into the into the set. And they said, "Here's a new song by local band Huey Lewis and the News it's called Do You Believe in Love.'" And they put it on the dial, and oh my God! First of all, they those Parallel One stations have big compressors. And they, and, and they make everything sound, you know, hot. 
and slightly distorted almost, but real hot. And so they put it on, and the song, I remember thinking two things. One was, oh, my God, it sounds like somebody else. <laughs> it was like, and we had, you know, we had produced it ourselves, and I'd sung it way too many times. But I, it almost, it just sounded like somebody completely different, number one. And, and two, it sounded like a hit. I thought it was going to be a hit, mm-hmm. and it was. Did you call the radio station yourself and pretend to be making requests for it? <laughs> did you call in and make requests like, hey, do you guys would play yeah, that? Yeah, we did that. We yeah, did right. all of that. Absolutely. We did all of that. Um, that's got to be the best feeling. Uh, I remember hearing myself on the radio for the first time, and it was probably, I, I don't know that I've ever been as excited by anything uh, than that. I've had several. You know, you think about good listening. So one, the, one of the neatest ones I had was driving into New York with my wife and my kid, my, my Kelly. Austin wasn't born yet. Kelly, yeah, Austin wasn't born yet. So Kelly had to be, this is 1984. Eight, yeah, 1984. And Harder Rock and Roll had just been released. Because 83, let's see, September of 83 was when Heart and Soul came out. And then I think Harder Rock and Roll was like March of 84 or something like that. And I'm driving into New York City with a rent a car. And I got Kelly in the, in the car seat in the back. And Sydney's here. And the radio. And, and right where the traffic converges into the Holland Tunnel, where four lanes come down to two. And it's a big, heavy traffic. Suddenly, Harder Rock and Roll comes on Z100. And I'm listening to it. And right, you know, it goes... Uh, uh, New York, New York is everywhere. They said, nobody said, I'd rather be, huh, uh. Right at that moment, as we're merging, a car in back of me goes, ah, uh, ah. Uh. It's just you wild. You think they were listening or just rude New York drivers? Yeah. <laughs> I think he was just listening to our song. Yeah, it may have been. <laughs> you never know. I mean, Z100 was a huge radio station at that time. You um, have sold... 30 million albums, correct? I think so, yeah. How much money do you get from each album? <laughs> like, is it uh, a dollar? Does it go up? I, I does don't it know. start low and go up, or how does no, it work? It, 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 it's, it's, it's the same, and I have no idea. I mean, it's a bit of a sore point, sore point really, because my master recordings are still owned by... U- uh, universal music. Uh huh. Universal. Uh, universal. Uh-huh. You know, Universal. EMI bought Chrysalis. Universal bought EMI. There's only three record labels anymore, but you know, that's remember when Prince had Slave and his. That's what he was on about. That we, in the old days, you did. None of us owned our 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 work. The, you know, the record company would front you money, and you'd record your record. But they owned that master. Even after they'd recoup the money, they still own the master till perpetuity. Now, there's a new law which, after 30 years, uh, it, you recover your masters. But for some reason, we, that is Huey Lewis and the News, are not, not uh, eligible for that because when we signed our record deal, we signed as a loan out corporation. My lawyer explained to me for tax purposes, which I don't quite understand, but. We don't own our, our, our work. It's, it's owned by, by Yumi. If everyone could just put $20 um, up here on the stage, <laughs> it'll be like busking again, you know? <laughs> but you did pretty well, it seems. Uh, I've been to your house. Everything seems pretty oh, yeah. good. Hey, yeah. I, you know, uh, as long as I, I'm, I'm, proudest, I'm proudest of the fact that, number one, we pretty much did everything ourselves in San Francisco and kind of stayed away from from Los Angeles not that not that I don't not that I don't like Los Angeles I like Los Angeles but in, in 1982 you know you just couldn't produce your own record it was a it was a huge deal I mean no, nobody produced their own record and so I'm I'm proud I'm proud of that fact and I'm also proud of the fact that the only commer- you know once we had, once sports hit um we made a, I, I made a deal with myself and, and the guys, and we talked that we would never, we made an agreement we would never do anything 
purely for commercial reasons, and and we haven't. We've just done stuff for creative things. What about when Coca Cola? This was on the heels of Michael Jackson doing the Pepsi commercial, and they almost killed him. <laughs> and Coca Cola wanted you guys to right. to do a commercial for them, yeah. and they offered you a, a ton of money, right? Yeah, they did. It was it was it was one of maybe two regrets I have. <laughs> <laughs> we um, yeah, we met with them, Coca Cola. That was when Michael Jackson, if you remember, um, did the got his hair on fire during the Pepsi ad or whatever. Yeah. And then Michael Jackson, if you remember, before that, no music stars did any corporate. We just did. It was it, it was, was frowned taboo. upon. Yeah, it was right. Absolutely. Ta- uh, same way that rock and roll bands, you didn't play Vegas. Nobody played Vegas. If you played Vegas. By the way, I saw you for the first time in Vegas. I I, I was happy to play Vegas. <laughs> but my, my the conventional wisdom was, once you play Vegas, you're done. You're just finished. And I thought, I don't know. Frank Sinatra played Vegas. You know, <laughs> what's wrong with? Uh, but anyway, so um, I forgot what was it. You name? were talking about the Coca Cola. Uh, oh, so yeah. So now, uh, when Michael Jackson was really the first guy to do a corporate tie-in and he, with the Pepsi deal, well, Coca-Cola asked to have a meeting. We had this meeting. We flew to Atlanta, you know, and they, they all had the red ties on. They're dressed like Coke. And, <laughs> no, I mean, you know, they're... I know, yeah. I've, I've had a thing. meeting like that, and, yeah, you're right. They there's are dressed like cans of Coke. There's a thing. Yeah, yeah. there's a thing. And, and I'll never forget it. The guy told me, he said, Huey, he says, you know, there's no, he says, the, the soda market's dominated by Coke and Pepsi. So we own 80% of the market. He says, and we always will. And he says, and Coke and Pepsi, uh, Coke and Pepsi. He says, and I'll tell you some a, a little secret. It's exactly the same product, Huey. <laughs> he says, the only difference is the image. He says, and... We we like to refer to certain things of has of having cokeness. I said, okay, you know, <laughs> sure. I said I got newsness. I get it, you know. <laughs> so then he said, well, and we figured out. Do you know what a Q quotient is, Huey? I said, no, I don't. He says, well, it's a combination of popularity and likability and credibility or whatever it was. He said, you know, you have the biggest Q quotient in the country right now. I said, you're kidding me. Said no, so we think you're our man, and here's what we want to do. And they started this whole idea about this commercial. He says, with heart of rock and roll. He says, I see you're on a train. I said, man, that's good because that's what that's what it sounded like. I kind of like the idea, you know. And he said, yeah. The anyway, so anyway, they offered us millions of dollars, and um, I agonized over it and said no. <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> the whole band decided to say no, right? What's that? The whole band agreed to not do the commercial. The, yeah. y- the news, the, like the, all of you guys were in, in on that, correct? I'm sorry, I didn't The guys that. in the band, uh, the news, they... The guys in the band. They didn't want to do it either. They didn't want to do it. Well, they yeah, they didn't want to do it either. Did one of them want to do it? They probably would. We didn't, you know, we, I don't know, we were kind of figuring it out for ourselves. We didn't, I don't think we consulted with the band, to be honest. Oh, I mean, you didn't. I see. I mean, I'm not sure if we did or not. Well, I but hope they don't find out about this. Well, you <laughs> <laughs> he will find out about this. He's not kidding about that. <laughs> Your cousin Sal's on the phone with them right now. He's yeah, got Sal's figuring it out Johnny right now. Cola on the phone. Um, you, uh, by the way, I saw Lionel Richie earlier, and he said to say hello to right. you. Love Lionel. And um, one of the things that was most exciting to me being a fan of yours as a kid was when you were in uh, the We Are the World video where you pop up and sing with Cyndi Lauper in that video. How did you wind up, how did that happen? How did you wind up in that song and in that video? Well, they asked us is the easy, is, is the easy one. And, um, um, you know, we were flattered and so on. And they asked the whole band, which is pretty cool. My manager made a case for that, which was really good. And so we show up and we did the chorus. It was an unbelievable evening, as you can imagine. I mean, you don't get to meet these kinds of people in your life, let alone hang out with them, you know. So it was really a fun evening. 
Uh, and and interestingly, we're there, and then I got Prince's line, right? In other words, Prince didn't show up for some reason. He boycotted the thing, and so I'm I'm out there in the in the foyer somewhere after we've sung the whole chorus, and and somebody comes to me and says, Quincy wants to see you. So I come out, okay, I come out, and he goes, Huey, hey, Smelly, come over here. He called Michael Michael Jackson. They, his nickname was Smelly because he was so clean. They called him Smelly. <laughs> he said, Smelly, come over here. He says, sing the line to Huey. And he sang the line. He says, sing it, Huey. I sang the line. He says, you got it. And that's how I got the part. Wow. That's pretty crazy. Bob Dylan was there that night. Bob Dylan was there. Did you talk to him? I, I didn't. I, yeah, 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 yeah. I did actually. I had we had a kind of a nice. We had a, we took breaks, union breaks, every sort of you know, two and a half hours, or whatever it is, and we would just mill around. And at this one break, I was talking to what Willie Nelson came over and said to me, "I hear you. You just took up golf. You're playing golf." I said, "Yeah, we do it on the road. You know, we it's something to do on the road. We put the clubs on the bottom of the bus and we play on the road." He said, "That's what we do too. We." put the clubs on the bus. He says, it's really a great thing. And Dylan comes over and catches me and Willie talking about that. And he says, are you guys talking about golf? <laughs> and Willie says, yeah. And, and, and Dylan goes, man, that's outrageous. <laughs> and I said, I said, no, Bob, that's not outrageous. It's just Nashville skyline was outrageous. This is golf. That is pretty crazy, I mean, to be in that situation like that. Dylan sent me a, a song. He sent me a song that I did not cut. He wrote a song for you? What an asshole. <laughs> I remember I said I had two regrets? What year was that? We Are the World. No, what year was did Dylan send you the song? Did he say, send me oh. a song shortly thereafter? Oh, like 85? He sent me a lovely note that said, Huey... I loved your last record, and I know the next one will be good, too. Here's a song of mine I think you might like, and, a, and another Junior Parker thing that you might enjoy. And, wow. And send me a cassette tape. Do you still have that letter? Somewhere. Can I somewhere. have it? I, I, don't, I don't know where it is. Did he si do you have the cassette of the song? Did he record the song? You nobody, don't know. I, nobody I know ever recorded the song. No one I, ever did. I, I, it, was, it was A... It was an alphabet kind of song. A is for something, B is for something. I can't Are remember. you sure it wasn't Oscar the Grouch that sent you? <laughs> <laughs> it was an alphabet song. <laughs> Are you sure one of your friends wasn't screwing around? <laughs> wow, you gotta find that but, uh, song. But I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a you know, Bob Dylan can do I mean he just painted the moon as far as I'm concerned. I mean, you know, I I'm, I guess not, really. Huh? I said, I guess not. I mean, yeah, I you know, know. I should have cut his song. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know what I was thinking. Well, I think I know. That gives me a little bit of insight because one of the great things about Huey is you really don't listen to anybody, and it has nothing to do with your hearing. It. <laughs> it well, I, I've I've never been a good listener, and now I have an excuse. <laughs> And Huey's nickname, which I discovered reading a, a book written by one of Huey's friends, was the Polish Bulldozer. You were known as the Polish Bulldozer, which even when I told you, yeah, your friends called you the Polish Bulldozer, you're like, no, they didn't. I was like, it's in the book you sent me to read. <laughs> so maybe they were calling you that behind your back. I don't know. Um, I've never, I know nobody who calls me the Polish Bulldozer. Except me. Except you, pal. Yeah. You uh, tell me what it is like. Um, first of all, I find I've found that there's a new generation of uh, of kids, of young people that like your music, yeah. and I feel like a lot of them have come to you through um, Back to the Future for sure, through the Power of Love and people really loving that movie, but also through like some video games like Guitar Hero. And uh, do you uh, does that surprise you when you have? It, do, it does surprise you, but. But I know that with my kids also. They know, you know, that somebody once explained there's no such thing as, uh, what is it? it's psychographics now. It's not demographics. It's psychographics. And there's certain kids just gravitate towards older traditional stuff. And, you know, nowadays with the computers, 
I mean, everything's at your fingertips. Back when we first started out, we had to, if you wanted to learn to play something, you played the record, and then you back, then you played it again, and then you play, and you played it again, and you and you copy it. You couldn't slow it down or do any of that stuff, you know. Back when, yeah, you were um, making hits in the in the eighties, you'd get a cassette from Bob Dylan and throw it in the fucking garbage. <laughs> We're going to go through your house and we're going to find that. That should have been on the album. Let's talk about this album. Now, one of the questions that I asked you the last time uh, we, were, we went fishing together was, it, and it occurred to me, and it's weird because, you know, you become just, you, you know, like the name Huey Lewis, you know, like that's not your real name, but to all of us that is your name. Sports is your biggest hit album. And I was thinking about it, and in fact, I was looking at a shirt that one of my 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 two year old was wearing, and it just said sports on it, and it's a real generic shirt, you know, with a ball. And I thought, why the fuck did Huey name his album Sports? That's the weirdest, most kind of non-specific name to give an album. And why did you name it Sports? Uh. Well, Huey Lewis and the News, sports. <laughs> news and sports. Uh, um, and, and then I... It, <laughs> what? I just think that's funny. <laughs> and now you've continued that by making an album called Weather. <laughs> weather. You got your new album is Weather. It's weather. So we've got news, sports, and weather. That's right. It's like an AM radio station. That's right. Yeah. And if I can get my hearing back, we're going to do business next. That's right. <laughs> so um, this album, Weather, it's um, seven songs, all recorded before you had your, your hearing problem. And um, is it, do you find that you have more creative freedom recording uh, a song now as opposed to doing it 30 years ago where there were a lot of people involved and now you can record it, put it out, distribute it all by yourself? Is it a, is it be a better process now? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and mind you, it's hard to captivate everybody because, you know, uh, the, the climate has changed. I mean, the, it, you know, information, everything is so set. I mean, think about, I like rhythm and blues music. In the early days, you know, uh, in the 60s, in the mid-60s, so you, think, you think about Otis Redding and, and uh, you know Aretha Franklin and uh, Sam and Dave and all these great these great artists that I love. The band was Booker T and the MGs, two black guys and two white guys. Songs were written by Spooner Aldham and and uh, uh, and Otis, a white guy and a black guy. Those studios were 50-50 almost, black and white people working together in Memphis. And so. Even in a, in a segregated society, and believe me, Memphis in 1965, well, you know, they, that's where Martin, got, Martin Luther King got shot that day right, right there in Memphis. Um, society was segregated, no question about it. But music was integrated. Today, society is much more integrated, but music is segregated. It's weird. You can't, you know, there's, there, information is so... Uh, com um, you know, segregated that there's all these different types of music. It's just not healthy. I mean, you can w listen to one kind of music all day long. You can listen to one kind of politics all day long. You can listen. That that's just not healthy. And what was nice about Top 40 Radio was that it was an editing process where we all tried to 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 have a hit. And you know, if you heard a Huey Lewis and the News song on 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 KFRC. The next song might be a Garth Brooks song, or a Commodore song, or a, or a, or an AC/DC song. But the but the fact is, we were all it was an editing process that was I think kind of kind of good in retrospect. You can't have a hit like that today. They just don't exist. Yeah, it happens much more rarely now. Much more rarely. I mean, a hit today is is a Geico ad. Yeah, <laughs> those are the best. Yeah. So I think we're at the time where we uh, we are going to open uh, open things up to questions, um, and um, 
we do not have a microphone. So uh, if you want to raise your hand, and I'll call on you. And then um, because we don't have a microphone, I'm going to repeat the question so that Huey can hear it, and then uh, we can then answer it, I guess will be the process. So does anyone have a question when I would like to start? Yes, in the middle right there. Yes. Um, first, I want to ask, are you single? <laughs> Huey, you've got a fan here. Um, she wants to know what your favorite song on weather is, the new... Uh, yeah. What's my favorite song on weather? Well, you know, um, the, you know, we we write them and produce them, so you're not really allowed to play favorites because you got to spend your time with the songs that aren't coming out so good. But so it's really. But now that it's all done, I don't know. I I kind of like. I like a lot of them. I like while we're young, and I like uh, remind me, remind me why I love you again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, now, I would imagine that most people haven't... How many of you have heard the new album already? Uh, okay, only like a few because it's not out yet. So, yeah. What is your favorite song on the new album? So that's the one. The only one that she's heard is the one she likes best. <laughs> Her love is killing me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes, next. That's, that's the only one you've heard, though, right? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So it's number one. Well, the with album a comes out Friday, right? Friday, Friday. yes. Friday. A wonderful Valentine's gift, yes. Yes, right here. Okay, we do have a microphone. Yeah, there you go. Uh, will your hearing ever be able to return, do you think, or is it a prognosis for uh, permanency? He wants to know about your hearing and whether it will come back, what the prognosis is. I don't know. We don't know. Uh, we, we really don't know. I, I thought I was kind of getting better for a while. You know, I, I gauged my hearing on 1 to 10, and I was a 6 for 9 weeks until December 12th. Um, and as a 6 with my hearing aids, I'm pretty good. I mean, I probably could have heard your question there. Could maybe even sing. I don't know that. But I, I haven't been able to figure it out because as soon as I'm book a rehearsal, my hearing crashes, you know. So um, uh, the prognosis, uh, you, they don't know. I, there's still stuff I'm trying. But unfortunately, since December 12th, this is now two months, I have not been. I was a, like a four or a five for a few days, a handful of days. But the rest of the time, I've been less than a three. The reason I, I know what number I am is because I have these hearing aids which have tones in them and my left ear which is the one that fluctuates it's it's five tones it's a it's an actually it's an F chord it's one three five one octave one and and uh, um, when my hearing is a six I can hear all five tones my hearing is a five I can barely hear all five when it's a four I can hear three tones when it's a three, I just hear the last tone, and like it is now, I can't hear any tones whatsoever. So I, I'm a pretty good job. When I say I was a three or a five, I mean, I, I know what I'm talking about. Well, what you didn't so. hear there, Huey, was everyone going, oh, in a compassionate way. Oh, you probably didn't hear that tone also. I'll explain I, it later. I, 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 didn't, I didn't get any of that. Yeah. Yes. Right there. Yeah. Here's a microphone. Remember that whole thing he said about the hearing? Yeah. Hi, my name is Hugh. I'm another Hugh the Third. You're a Hugh the Third, I hear. Um, He's a Hugh the Third also. What? Huey doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> my question is. How did you enjoy your acting career? I, I thought you were great in Hot in Cleveland and duets. He wanted to know about your acting career, Hot in Cleveland, duets, if that's something that you enjoyed doing. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I enjoy acting when there's real acting required. You know, unfortunately, I don't get a lot of parts because <laughs> I'm a singer and not an actor. You know, they go to real actors. But uh, but I, I really enjoy it, and I'm, I'm if I can't sing... I'm, I'm, I need to be creative somehow, so why not? I mean, 
Oh, you got? Do you have a part for me? Is that it? Oh, good. Well, you you want my email or something? <laughs> do not give him your email. <laughs> uh, next question. Yes, right there. Uh, you're raising your hand. Yes, yes, right there in the middle. Okay. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, Even I can't pleasure. hear you. Okay, thank you for being here tonight. It's a real pleasure to hear what you have to say. My question is, does your son have your musical gifts and talents, and does he want to be involved with the music industry that you could pass that on to him as a generation? Well, she asked a very sexist question. She asked <laughs> if your son has your musical gifts and talents without asking if your daughter has your musical <laughs> gifts and talents. Um, and um, if... If that's something that uh, your son Austin is is interested yeah, in, yeah, actually Austin is. Um, well, he's a, he plays guitar and he's a pretty good guitar player, and he's actually a pretty, he's a, he's a kind of a musicologist. I mean, he he knows like Chet Baker, and he, he you know he's wildly diverse musical interests, but uh, but pretty knowledgeable. We're gonna take one more question, and uh, from this gentleman dude, right there, you didn't tell him about our musical. Our we musical. To, oh our, yeah, we do have to talk. Our, right, you're. Oh the yeah. One that you were gonna be in, but you had the show. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Huey is working on a musical that I actually went to go see down in San Diego, and uh, called The Heart of Rock and Roll. Did any of you see that musical? Oh, great. And so it's uh, it's you know it's a music a compilation of his hits, and a new song is in there, and you're hoping to take that and, to Broadway. And since since Jimmy saw it, and and since we put it up in San Diego, we've. W workshopped it in New York, and we've partnered up with Tony Award winning pro uh, executive producer Hunter Arnold, and um, we're going to try and get it to Broadway next season. The next season. Uh, next season of Broadway. That would be great. The gentleman that I, yes, I called on there. Yes, go ahead. Since you haven't been able to tour, how's your golf game, and what do I got to do to get a tee time? He wants to know how your golf game is and what he has to do to get a tee time. He wants to know how my golf my golf game is horrible. <laughs> no, I mean it, it's 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 horrible. It's, Huey's um, falling apart, guys. <laughs> it's horrible. I, I, and I, I I can't hit it anywhere anymore. And and uh, you know I just played in the Pebble Beach Pro Am for the thirtieth year, in a, uh, and and um, Spyglass is a notoriously tough golf course. And the the shots that the, the 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 holes that I get shots on, which is six, eight, nine, thirteen. Oh, 16, you're at a thirteen. Is this a hearing thing or is this a golf thing right now? <laughs> numbers. Numbers. All numbers. Okay. All right. You don't want to confuse Jimmy with numbers. <laughs> it's a, it's a <laughs> well, I, I can't get to the greens in two anymore. Hardly, you know. So I've lost a lot of length. I'll be 70 years old this year, so it's kind of tough. Seven years old in July. You look good, Huey. You do. I mean, I know everything is going is haywire. Is anybody here my my age or older? Atta, baby. There you go. Three uh, of us. There's four of us in here. Atta, babe. So that is the extent of our time. Um, we, are, uh, we are done, but I do want to encourage you to go on Friday to download or pre-order it right now. Huey's new album, Weather. It's got seven songs. I love it. You know, I drove him. I don't know what was going on, but he wouldn't give me the goddamned album until like last week. And I finally was like, everyone else has this album except for me. You played it for me once while we were drunk fishing. I mean, <laughs> that wasn't enough. I need to spend time with it. But uh, I love it. And, uh, and we do hope that your hearing improves. I mean, it's... Uh, it's, it's not just you that is affected by this. We're all suffering here, Huey. And so <laughs> please support um, Huey's endeavors, the Broadway show when it comes out next year. You're all invited, by the way, to the Broadway show. And the album called Weather. It will be available on Friday. Huey Lewis, everybody. Thank you for coming and, tonight. And may, I, may I just say thank you very, very much? And and I, I I need I need to tell you what a wonderful friend Jimmy Kimmel is. 
what an amazing person this guy is. I've known lots of people in, in the business, in the music business, in show business, and this is the most genuine person you've ever met. There's no bullshit with Jimmy Kimmel. He's a wonderful guy, and I'm so lucky to know him. Thanks, Jimmy.